Financial Modeling, Topic 11B, Accrued Interest, Clean and Dirty Prices, Yield Curve Models, Forward, forward Interest Rates, Copyright Lou Gattis. In this topic, we're going to compute accrued interest for bonds and invoice prices, also called dirty prices. Construct yield curves using an empirical curve fitting model and also be exposed to theoretical models. And compute forward interest rates. So the first thing I'm going to talk about are clean versus dirty prices. If I were to look at a price of IBM on Bloomberg or Reuters or, or TradeStation, it might look like this. So here's from Bloomberg. is an IBM bond, and it has a price of 136.91, which means it's selling for about 131% of par. This price represents what we call the quoted price or clean price. When you go to actually buy the bond, you're going to pay a higher price because bonds, when you purchase them, and if you purchase them in between coupon payment dates, you actually owe some of the next coupon payment to the seller of the bond. So when you see a quoted bond price, we call that the clean price. It is the price excluding the extra interest we have to pay to the seller. So here's an example I want to give you. Say there's a hundred dollar bond and pays a ten dollar coupon every year. If I am one year from the coupon and say the bond was selling a par, the present value of all payments would be a hundred dollars. Now as I get closer and closer to the coupon payment date and I start, keep calculating the present value Say that the moment or the day before the first coupon payment date, the present value of all future payments are actually, is actually going to be 110. Now think about why the value increased. As we get the, the cash flows are actually fixed, and as we get closer and closer and closer to the for all the cash flows, in fact, the present value increases up until the point where your moments from the coupon payment date and the price then is say 110. Now the minute it pays the coupon, the price is going to drop by that coupon because that cash flow is no longer a future cash flow and it'll start climbing up again by the value of the coupon. So this would be a graph of say an annual payment bond where the price stays primarily at par but it goes up and down as we get closer to the coupon payment date and then the payments paid up to the coupon payment date payments paid and so on. So we say that a bond, if rates aren't, the yields aren't changing, has a sawtooth pattern in prices. So this price here, this jagged price, the sawtooth price pattern, we call that the dirty price or the invoice price. It's also equal to the present value of all future payments. Now you can see why it might be confusing if you're quoting bond prices or you look at a historical series and say, well, this, this bond appears to be very volatile. When in fact, it's actually maybe trading you know, at par the whole time. It's just we're getting closer to coupon payment dates. That's the reason why when we quote a bond's price, we'll just quote the price without that coupon, without that accrued interest in a coupon. So we may quote the price of that bond over that entire life as close to 100, even though its present value of payments uh, goes up and down. Another way of thinking about dirty or invoice prices versus clean prices is to think about what if I were to buy the bond right before it made a cash payment, a coupon payment? Well, say the poor person that's selling the bond has been waiting 364 days for that coupon payment. And then they sell the bond to you. Now you have the right to both the PAR and coupon payments. Well, it so happens that if you buy a bond in between coupon payment dates, you owe a fraction of the next coupon to the seller of the bond. We call that the accrued interest in the bond. So, for example, if you were to buy the bond halfway between coupon payment dates, you owe half of the next coupon to the seller. If you buy the bond, say, the day before the next coupon date, you may owe almost the entire coupon to the seller. So when the seller invoices you for this bond, which was quoted at, say, a price of 100 but you bought it right before a coupon payment date, you're going to be invoiced the quoted price plus the accrued interest. Now the trick in, in calculating uh, the clean versus dirty price is figuring out what this accrued interest is. So again, to recap, 
a quoted bond price is not what you pay for a bond. What you actually pay is something called the dirty price or the invoice price. The invoice or dirty price is the quoted price plus the accrued interest. Or you can think of the clean price as the dirty price minus the accrued interest. By the way, Excel's price and yield functions, or at least their price function, uh, is only giving you the clean price or the quoted price. So let's look at a little example here of this bond. Here's a bond which is providing uh, it's an 8% three-year semi-annual coupon bond, $1,000 par. We're exactly six months away from the first coupon payment date. So you can think of this as a bond as brand new issue or, or, or just paid a coupon payment. Uh, bottom line has three years left, but you're still six months away from the first semi-annual coupon. So my years are half a year, one year, one and a half, two, two and a half, three years are the payments. And since it's an 8% coupon, semi-annual payment bond, that has a par of 1000 it pays $80 in interest a year or $40 every six months. So you can see the coupons. And then at maturity, you get the par plus the coupon. If I then take the present value of these $40 coupons, discount it at these periods using the six-month discount rate, which would be, say, half of this interest rate, the annual uh, yield maturity or required return or discount rate, whatever you want to call it. You take the present value of all these cash flows, discount at this rate for six months for these years, you'll get a present value of 961.63. Now, on a bond, on a newly issued bond or a bond that just paid a coupon payment, this price is both the clean quoted price and the dirty invoice price since no interest is accrued. I also use the PV function. If you go into the spreadsheet, you'll see I use the PV function to calculate the same value. Then I made up some dates. Say today is 1-1-2010 and the bond matures exactly in one year, 1-1-2013. And there's my 8% coupon, 9.5% 9 .5, 9 .5 yield, redemption value 100, frequency 2 pounds per year. And let me just put a basis of zero for now. Uh, for Excel's price function. Then I insert Excel's price function using these parameters and notice I get 96.163 as the price of the bond which is the same as this. Now since this bond has a par of a thousand I'll take 96 percent of a thousand I will actually pay 961.63 for the for this bond. Now let's fast forward three months. This three-year bond is now a 2.75-year bond. And now we're three months away from the first coupon payment, and then another coupon payment, six months, six months, six months, six months, and six months. So now the cash flows are the same, but now we're closer to all of them. If I take the present value of all the cash flows, I now get 984. That's the present value of all future cash flows, including the all of the first one. However, this is not the price you're going to be quoted in the market. If we're exactly halfway in between coupon payment dates, we owe half of this next coupon, 40, to the seller. So if I subtract the 20, the accrued interest, the percentage of the interest that has accrued since the last coupon payment date, I will get not 984, I would subtract 20, get 964. That's what would be the quoted or clean price. So when I plug this bond back into Excel using the new date, right, three months later, same information, notice I get the 9640 for the bond. That is the clean price. That is not the present value of future cash flows. So that's an important thing to remember. When you use an Excel's price function, it is not giving you the present value of all future cash flows. It is giving you the clean price. If I want to get the dirty price or invoice price or the present value of all cash flows, I need to add back the $20 and then I get the 984. That's my total invoice price if I bought this bond. So to recap, when you buy bonds in between coupon payment dates, there's both a clean or quote price and then there is a dirty or invoice price. The price you see on your monitors is probably a quoted price. The price you calculate using Excel is a quoted or clean price. When you actually buy the bond, you're going to pay the accrued interest to the seller. 
that'll add to that and we'll call that the invoice price. So back to this IBM bond I mentioned earlier. So this IBM bond is an 8 and 3 eighths annual coupon rate, matures 11 1 2019. And I, I, this is from a few years ago. Uh, I collected this data on March 25th, 2010. So if we bought this bond today, I'd say if it's settled in three days, I take possession, say March 28th, 2010. So this bond is about a nine year bond remaining life. This is the bid and ask price from Bloomberg. It's, uh, they're the same for now for some reason, but the bid price 13691 bid 13691 ask. That again is a quoted or clean price. And then based on this bid and ask price, Bloomberg calculates a yield to maturity of 441 for bid and ask since the prices are the same. Looking at some more information, this uh, bond rated uh, looks like a A plus bond or A1 from Moody. It's senior unsecured. That might help you in figuring out the recovery rate if you're cal calculating the expected return. It's a semi-annual payment. The first coupon ever issued on this bond was May 1st, 1990. The bond was initially issued in 1989. So initially this was about a 30 year bond. However, a lot of time has passed and now it's only a nine year bond. Now to calculate how much interest has accrued, you can see it's, it's, it's roughly March of 2010. This matures in November of 2019. So it's again, it's a nine year bond. Now to calculate the accrued interest, I need to know from March of 2010, when was the last coupon interest date and when is the next coupon interest date? And you can use this as a general rule. Look at the maturity date, November 1st. If it's a semi-annual payment, add six months and we'll say May 1st. So the coupon payment dates must be maturity day and month, November 1st, and May 1st, six months later for a semi-annual payment bond. So I can use that data to calculate the time that has passed since the last coupon date. So I just grab this little spreadsheet here and let's we'll just double click on it and take a look at it. If the settlement, the purchase date of the bond is 328-2010 and the last coupon date is 11-1-2009, the next coupon date is 5-1-2010. Again, we're sitting on this date, March 28th. Coupon dates are November 1st and May 1st. So the last one must have been last November, November 2009. The next one must be next May, 5-1-2010. So this bond, the last one was November. So we had November, December, January, February, almost all of March. Almost five months have passed since the last coupon date. So we owe someone roughly five-sixths of the interest, which is about 80%. But let's go ahead and calculate the exact percent. Uh, in Excel, if you subtract any two dates, say that minus that, that will give you the number of days between. And if you didn't know this, actually every date in Excel is represented by a number. And actually dates are only formats. What's actually in this cell, if I go um, back to home and, and turn that into a number, these are actually dates, or are numbers. 40,265, 40,118, and so on. Each date adds, each day adds another number to the count. So that's why I can subtract one date from another date. And actually where these 40,000 came from, if I were to actually write in the date of, say, 1-1-1900, and then convert that to a date, you'll notice that that is day one. So whoever started programming computers determined that the beginning of the, of the computer universe is January 1st, 1900. And they determined that that would be day one. So if I look at today's date, which uh, when I'm doing this, uh, this podcast today, it's 319. 2015. 
if I look at the date on that, or sorry, the number value for that date, I can determine that there's been 42,082 days since January 1st, 1900. But I'm digressing a little bit. Let's get back to this. If I want to know the number of days since, say, the last coupon payment date, all I need to do is subtract 328-2010 from 11-1-2009, as long as they're entered in and using date format. And if I subtract the last coupon date from the next coupon date, I realize there's 181 days between those two. If I take that fraction, 147 days since last payment, divided by 181 days between payments, I owe the seller of the bond 81% of the next coupon payment, which is about uh, the next coupon payment is half of eight and three eighths times a thousand. So it's about 40 some dollars. I owe somebody 80% uh, of about $40. Again, the uh, annual coupon rate was eight and three eighths. Half of that is a little bit over 4% on a thousand dollars. I owe someone 80% of that $40. That is if you counted days using the actual calendar. That is a, called a day count convention. If you use the actual number of days in a month and the actual number of days in a year, that's called the act, act, day count convention or accrual method. That is not what's used for this bond. For this bond, and, and there are a number of ways of calculating the number of days or number of days between dates in uh, finance. For all corporate bonds, we use a 3360 day count convention, and this is only used for calculating accrued interest. What this strange day count convention is, is just assume there's 30 days in every month. So if you're going from March 28th, I'm sorry, uh, November 1st, 2009, and figuring out how many days to 328, 2010, well, I would just start counting days, assuming there are 30 days in November, 30 in December, 30 in January, 30 in February, and then add, it, add 28 days for March. If I do that, I actually do get 147. And then if I look at the number of days between payments, say 11-1-2009 and 5-1-2010, I can just assume 30 days in November, December, January, February, March, and April and I get 180, not 181. So there are actually 181 days using a calendar between these two dates. However, if there were only 30 days in a, in a month, there would be 180 days. Well, for calculation of accrued interest for corporate bonds, and you'll see it, you'll see in this slide on Bloomberg, the day count convention is 3360. So to calculate accrued interest, I'm going to take 147 over 180, not 147 over 181. And then, by the way, the only reason these are the same is there must have been on average 30 days per month in the months from March to November. So if I want to calculate the accrued interest, there's a little more detailed schedule. Let's take a look at this. By the way, I just took all the values <clears throat> from Bloomberg and plugged them in, and I used Excel's yield function. I got 4.41%, which is the exact same thing that Bloomberg was telling me. So if you're given price, 136.691, I can use Excel to calculate yield. So that's what I do. And also in the yield function, it asked me to put in a basis. If you actually type in the yield function, the last one is a yield, and if you don't type anything for the basis, it uses zero. Zero is 3360, by the way, which is used for all corporate agency debt like Fannie, Freddie, uh, Ginny, and TVA bonds, Ginny May, all municipal bonds like states and local municipalities, and mortgage backed securities all use this 3360. So again, if I plug in all my information, including the basis, again, Excel, zero is 3360, I get the 441. And I just want to also show you that if I plug in the 441 as the yield, and then plug all the bonds information, I get the 13690. So in other words, if you're given price, you can compute yield. If you're given yield, you can compute price. So 
So this bond has a price, a quoted price, a clean price of 136.91. The par on this bond is $1,000. That's actually written here. You don't really see it. But if I were to move this, you can see that the par, I'm sorry, the par on the bond is $1,000 each. So on this bond, if the price is $136.91 and the par is $1,000, I'll take 130% of $1,000. The bond's actual pr quoted price is $1,306. However, I'm going to pay more than that. I owe 81% of the interest, next coupon payment, to the seller. All right, remember we calculated 81.7% using a 33.60. So 81.7% of half of this 8.375% coupon. So that's a $83.75% coupon per year or about 41 so uh, $41 and a little bit more per every six months. So 81% of the $41 or so of the coupon is $34.20. I add that to the clean price and this is the invoice price. This is actually what I'll pay for the bond. Now if I were using ACT over ACT I'd have an actual number of days since the last payment of one payment of 147, and the actual number of days between the last two, or the, the coupon payment dates is 181. That fraction would give me 81.2. So if this were an act over act, it'd be 34, 3401. If it were act over 360, I would just take the, the actual days over 180. And if it's act over 365, I'd take the actual days over 182.5. So depending on the accrual method, you'll get a different accrued interest, which will then give you a different invoice price. Now, if you have corporates, agencies, munis, or MBSs, mortgage-backed securities, I would assume a 3360. T-bills, commercial paper, I'd use an act over 365 or act over 360. And for treasury notes and bonds, use an act over 365. Now, a reason a question comes up: Why would we ever have a 3360? Well, imagine 75 years ago. Uh, before the invention of any computer or any tabulating device, and you want to calculate accrued interest really quickly, it would be handy just to assume 30 days in every month. And that's why was the historical basis of using these types of methods. So that concludes clean price, dirty price, and accrued interest. Let's talk a little bit about term structure. And actually, let's grab some data first, and then we'll talk about it. Let's grab this data. These are uh, 400 and some non-callable triple B bonds with maturities between one half year and 10 years gathered on August 11th, 2006. And I got this from the DeModern textbook. So let me grab these bonds. I'm going to grab them all. And, and the data is on the disk of the DeModern textbook. I'll go to the bottom. Copy. And let me paste that into Excel. All right, so say you're looking at adding a triple B corporate to your portfolio. And say your, your, your boss asks you to, to choose one of the best triple B corporates you can find. So you do a search, a quick list, and your boss wants you to get something between a half year and 10 years. Um, and so you do a quick quick uh, dump of data and, and these are a bunch of bonds with a bunch of yield. So ideally you'd like to get a bond at a cheap price or a high yield. So let's uh, let's just graph this data here. Just the maturity and the yield. Now I'm going to put in an XY scatter. So these are my 400 and some bonds. There seems to be a strong relationship between yield to maturity and mature. I'm sorry, yield to maturity and maturity. Looks like as the bonds increase their maturity, their yields go up, and then although they kind of go up at a really high increasing rate, and then they flatten out, and then looks like it may turn up a little bit here. 
you wanted to try to, uh, and so you might look at this list and say, well, which one of these bonds seems like it's going to be a buy? Well, all else equal, I'd like to have bonds that have high yields. You know, assuming these all triple B corporates, uh, the bond that might stick out to me is, well, this one has a really good yield right here. If I look at this bond, it's a, it's about a 5.8 or, or so maturity. And looks like if I look at the data point here, Looks, looks like it's got a 5.81 uh, year maturity and has a 748 yield. So I can go find this bond actually. Let me see. 581. Here it is here. So that bond that looks good is this Aramark corporate bond with a 5% coupon matures in 2012. Again, the date here was 2006. So I got about a six-year bond. It has a yield of 748. So I like this bond. If it's if it has the same risk of the bonds around it, right? Say, so look at these three bonds here. They're all about 5.8 remaining life, and they all are triple B corporate non-callables. I'd rather buy this cheap high yield bond than this than these two say expensive low yield bonds. So that one looks interesting, the arrow mark. Alright, so let me just highlight this bond here. So I'm interested in maybe buying this bond, this arrow mark. All right. So the next thing I might look at as well, what would be a fair yield and fair price for this bond? Again, it was selling for $88 and had a yield of $748. What would be a fair yield? Well, fair yield might be somewhere around here in the middle of the pack, which is about, a, say, a 5.5% yield. And if I were to revalue the bond in a 5.5% yield versus a 748 yield, it's going to become have a much higher price than 88. So it might say, well, it's it's drastically undervalued bond. So let's figure out how much undervalued it is. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fit a line through this data, some best fit line, find out what a 5.8 yield, a 5.8 year bond should yield, and then use that to price the error Mac. So let me get a best fit line. I'll, I'll right click on the data. Add trend line, and I could try to fix a, a, a linear best fit line, but it, see it doesn't fit too well. If I had to fit a line there, so I can try say an exponential. Well, that doesn't seem to fit either. Try a logarithmic. So it's just diff different mathematical functions for lines. That one fits pretty well. Let me try one more, a polynomial, and specifically a third order polynomial. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. So a third order, order polynomial, I like the way this fits. It kind of misses the boat here on the front end, but it actually it curves up nicely, flattens out, and then starts to rise again for the last couple of years. It look like the data might be doing. So I'm going to click on uh, display at the top. So here's the equation for this best fit line. that the equation of this line, the y value, the yield, is equal to 2.28 percent plus 1.52 times the yield minus 0 0.0023 times yield squared plus 0 0.0001 times yield cubed. That that's what it means to have a third order polynomial. And the fact that the func it's a function of time, time squared, and time cubed allows us to kind of have these several inflection points in the curve. Let me show you actually how to create that manually, create that, uh, that equation of a line. If I were to just put the maturity in there, t, and then take t squared and t cubed, So let me just put in a link to t, maturity squared, 
this is maturity in years and maturity cubed All right, so there's my T, maturity, maturity squared, and maturity cubed. And I'll just copy these down for all the bonds. And I'm going to run a regression. I want to regress the yield of the bonds on their maturity, maturity squared, and maturity cubed. Data, data analysis regression put in my y value just yield do my shift n down put in my three x variables shift n down click on labels since I had labels And then let me put the output in this sheet. So let me click on here and let me put the output. I'm just going to put it down here. All right, so I'm going to regress yield on t, t squared, t cubed. Remember when you do a multivariable regression, these three x variables have to be contiguous. I couldn't say grab this one and have t squared and t cubed over here. I'll hit OK. And here is my equation parameters. And let me bring the graph over just to show you too. Notice actually the this regression explains 85% of my variation in yield. So it explains a lot of the variation in yield, you see. And you can see your their equation. 0.0221 is the intercept. 0.02211. Actually, this shows a lot more decimal places. That's uh, always use regression before proceeding with this exercise. Don't use this equation. There's just not enough decimal places. Plus 0.01525. That's this times t. Plus negative 0.00231 times t squared. Plus 0 0.00012, again there's a lot more decimal places in there, times t cubed. So I can use that equation to get a third order polynomial model yield. So I'll just take my intercept, I'll anchor that, plus, now I just need to do t times a coefficient on t, t squared times a coefficient on t squared, t cubed times a coefficient on t cubed, making sure I anchor the coefficients down there. So t times coefficient anchor plus t squared times t squared times coefficient on t squared, anchor that, plus t cubed times coefficient on t cubed, anchor that. Let me make sure that looks right. Intercept, m34, 33, 34, 35, 36, okay, g3, h3, okay, so that should work. So let's make that a percentage and copy it down. So 3.03%. So this first bond, this Panhandle Eastern Pipeline Company, that bond has a yield of 224. My model says it should have a yield of 303. Let's see what that means. So that shortest bond has a yield of 224. So that looks like it's 
Looks like it's this bond right here it has a yield of 224. If it were on this line, it would be 303, which would be up here. And let's look at our hour mark bond. 778 is the yield. It looks like the yield should be roughly in this 5.5% range. Actually, let's go down and actually look at that bond real quick. That arrow mark bond, it has a yield of 748. If priced along that line, in other words, if there's a single relationship between price and yield and it's reflected on that line, it should have a yield of 566, like the bonds in its neighborhood there, its maturity neighborhood. So the last step I want to do is if you assume that the only thing matters to determine the value of these bonds, you know, since they're all AAA non-callable corporates, I'm sorry, triple B non-callable corporates, the only thing that's different about them is their maturity. If that were true, they should say price along this line. So let's price this bond as if it had that 5.6% yield. So I'll just use the price function. But before I do that, I need a maturity date. Uh, this date was gathered, this data was gathered on August 11, 2006. Let's write that up here. August 11, 2006. I'll make that an input. So now I can put in my third order polynomial model price. So I'm going to use the price function equals price. Uh, let me click on the function. So now I need settlement date. I'll anchor that since it's the same for all bonds. And then I just need maturity. That's maturity date. Annual coupon rate. Yield. I'm going to use the model yield. I want to price the bond as if it had this model yield. Redemption is always 100. This is semi-annual payment bond. And we'll use a zero since this is a corporate. Corporates have a basis of zero, which is 3360. So these are my model prices. This is what I should pay for the bond if I assume that this correct yield lies along this line. I can then look at my Aramac bond. This bond is priced at 88.50, which gives a yield of 748. If it's priced along that line, it would have a yield of 566, and the price should be selling at 96. So you can say, just like you have a fundamental analysis, analysis of a stock, you can say your fundamental analysis of Aramark is that it's worth 96.70 when the market price is 88.50. So I can buy the bond at 88.50, and maybe the price will jump to 96, and I'll, I'll make a, a nice little capital gain. Or I'll just buy it at that cheap price and earn that high yield. So this is uh, one particular way of coming up with a term structure model. It's an empirical term structure model, meaning it's just using the data and fitting a line to, to, to look at a, a fit a yield curve. And once you do that, you can then say, well, if I believe that that's the right way to price bonds just based on maturity for the same, um, same type of bond, say triple B corporate non-callables, these would all be undervalued bonds above this line. These would all be undervalued bonds below this, I'm sorry, overvalued bonds below this line. So this Aramark bond may be the perfect bond. It may be one that the market's missed and you can get a bargain. However, be careful. The reason why this thing might be so cheap is because maybe the rating agencies haven't exactly caught on to their financials that were released this morning that, that showed they're in dire straits and then their coverage ratios have fallen apart. So what you, what you think is kind of the normal triple B corporate may be about to be downgraded to say a double B or a single B. And maybe you're not the smartest person finding a cheap bond. Maybe you're the, the sucker in the market and you're just the only one that doesn't realize that it's about to be downgraded. It's really trading like a C bond or something like that.
or maybe you know reaching back to the last lecture maybe this bond has ultra low recovery rates compared to these other bonds so if you calculate the default adjusted expected return maybe they plot along a better line uh, again maybe because this one has lower recovery rates so this is one way to think about bond or corporate bond management I want to look at bonds of say similar maturity and similarly similar rating and maybe try to find some outliers and some outliers that aren't being caused by fundamental inferiorities of, of this bond. One thing I will note, be, uh, warn you again, is one, you may be find me, finding mispriced bonds or you may just be getting say bad quotes or the, a, a late to uh, downgrade bond. Also notice I would not trust any of this data down here. If I look at this graph, uh, all these bonds appear to be overvalued. Uh, but it looks like the curve just doesn't fit the front end uh, because it's such a steep drop. So I wouldn't trust the data on this front end. So this is a, a, a term structure model. And this is specific, specifically a regression or empirical model. And the nice part about it is it's theory free. I, well, I guess the only theory is uh, yield drives, I'm sorry, um, maturity drives yield. Uh, the, the down part is that you not you don't really know why the yield curve is shaped like this. You know, why why shouldn't it be flat and all these bonds are say undervalued, or why shouldn't it go up steeper and all these bonds are overvalued? Well, in that case, you might want to use something uh, a, a different type of model, a theoretical model. There's a couple classes. There's equip equilibrium models and no arbitrage models, and what these models do is they make assumptions about say the interest rate process. And then based on that and some uh, some some difficult math and stochastic uh, processes, uh, come up with equations to come up with a theoretical yield curve, not just one that fits the data the best. Uh, one model, I'll just give you an, an example, is a Vasicek model. Now, a Vasicek model is an interest rate model that assumes that uh, all interest rates and the whole yield curve comes from what is currently the short-term interest rate and what short-term interest rates should be in the long run. So this model actually has four parameters in this entire model. Those parameters are the current short-term interest rate, the short-term interest rate of the long run, the volatility of interest rates, and a factor for how fast short-term interest rates will go to their long-term spot. And someone has figured out the mathematics, and, well, made some more assumptions. Uh, one of the big assumptions that changes in the short rate follow a random walk process and are normally distributed with mean reversion. And they were able to work out the mathematics. Actually, if you go into my appendix, which I'm not going to go back into, you can see a little bit of the detail of this model, of, of the model of the short rate and the equations that it uses. So Vasicek can use that information and derive just from those four parameters using equations an entire yield curve. So based on these parameters here, this would generate say an upward sloping yield curve. And then I just, all it is I change some of the parameters and you can get humped yield curves, you can get downward sloping yield curves and so on. But all I want to do is, is highlight the fact that uh, we aren't, we're only covering one type of model in, the, in this uh, section. That's an empirical model. There are other classes of models. Um, the ones that uh, I've seen in industry are Hull White and uh, Cox, Ingersoll, Ingersoll Ross, uh, and Ho Lee are, are some models that I've used in the past. And, and they become more important for pricing derivatives and mortgage backed securities versus looking at just corporate bonds. All right, the last thing I want to do is talk about forward interest rates versus spot rates and zeros. Every interest rate you've ever seen probably in your life, unless you've taken a derivatives class, is a spot interest rate. In other words, an interest rate uh, on a borrowing or lending that starts today. So say you get a one-year loan or a one-year CD at the bank that lasts for, again, starts today and lasts for one year. We'd say that instrument starts today and lasts for one year. And we say that's a spot rate. But you can also go to a bank and ask for a loan or a savings instrument that, say, starts one year from now and ends two years from now. That would be a forward interest rate. All right, so corporations use this. Uh, say a company needs to borrow a billion dollars 
two years from now and wants a five-year loan. They can go to a bank and say, give me an interest rate, a forward interest rate on a loan starting two years from now that lasts three years or five years. So we'd say it starts in period T1 and ends in period T2. Now to, you can calculate interest rates on those types of instruments by looking at the spot rate and in calculating an implied forward rate. And you use it doing an, uh, an arbitrage argument. And the argu arbitrage argument is you can reconstruct, you can construct uh, multiple ways of getting a particular uh, maturity uh, investment using spot and forward interest rates. So let me just show you a quick example, a couple more slides. Say that the one year zero coupon spot rate, say a one year CD that pays you at the end of the year offers 6% and the annualized two year zero coupon CD or bond gives you six and a half and the spot three year starting today matures in three gives you seven percent per year for three years and you're interested in, in what would in theory what should be the one year rate one year from now we'll call that R12 and what should be the one year rate two years from now that would be R23 starts in year two and starts in year three well you can make an arbitrage argument that you would be indifferent between a two-year instrument that gives you six and a half percent a year the payoff on that bond would be a dollar times one plus the two-year rate squared and you would be indifferent between that one two-year spot rate and a one-year spot contract plus a one-year forward so if I enter into a one-year CD say I'll earn R01 six percent and then I can all simultaneously at the time right now at the time I enter into the one year bond I can enter into a forward contract to invest one between years one and two and I'll get one you know R one two now you should be indifferent or the market should be priced there's no arbitrage between getting a two year instrument and two one year instruments so and ensure no arbitrage these yield, these should have the same payoffs. So I can just take this equation, solve for R12, and if I do that, I get the interest rate one starts in year one and ends in year two is one plus the two year rate squared, 1.065 squared, over one plus the one year rate minus one. So the implied one year rate, one year from now, is 7.02%. I can use the same logic to calculate the one year rate two years from now. I should be indifferent between a three-year investment in the spot market and a two-year spot, mar spot uh, market investment and a one-year forward. So I should be indifferent between a three-year rate versus a two plus one-year rate. Well, the general formula for calculating that, say uh, the, the forward interest rate that starts in year two and ends in year three, starts in year two, ends in year three, would be one plus the three year rates cubed over one plus the two year rate time period one when it starts to the second. So my one year rate one year from now would be one plus the three year spot rate cubed plus or divided by one plus the two year rate squared minus one. 8.07%. So that should be the one year forward. I'm sorry, the one year forward two years from now. Uh, and by the way, how I got this 7% for the three year? Uh, actually, I got this out of McDonald's derivatives textbook. And he shows that uh, the, the uh, $1 par zero coupon bond is selling for $81.61. I'm sorry, uh, 0.816 cents. So you pay 81 cents for a bond that matures in one year, I'm sorry, three years at one dollar. So one dollar over one plus the three rate to the cubed must be equal to 81 cents. So this R03 must be the zero coupon rate. So I'll solve this equation for R03, which is one over the 81 cents raised to the one third power minus one. That's how I got 7% and plugged in here. So that's what we want to cover today. We talked about yield curve models.
empirical and then the uh, didn't really cover it, but talked about other types of theoretical models based on the characteristics of interest rates. We did some empirical curve fitting using that third order, third order polynomial. We also computed bond price and yield using uh, accrued, accrual methods. So we also talked about how to calculate uh, accrual percentages using different day count conventions. And we lastly talked about forward interest rates.